thank the Lord for Dr. Minho for his uh, talk to us and challenge as well and inspiration. So we will now open the floor for questions so you can further visualize what's the next thing you will do in your own ministry. Two questions. So the first is, uh, aside from waiting patiently for the people to retire, how else, uh, what else can we do for those uh, church leaders who have a role in making decisions, in leading the direction of the church? What else can we do when there are church leaders who are not missions-minded? Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question is you mentioned that one-third of the members are on board with missions, one-third they act like they are on board, but they're not, and one-third, totally, they totally don't care. So how can we respond to these kinds of members? Thank you so much. Both are, both are difficult questions. <laughs> so her first question was, uh, uh, if your leadership is not missionally minded, then how do you go about bringing change? Um, Okay, um, I think we have to be careful because, um, uh, you know, if a pastor or elder or deacon uh, who is clearly a leader uh, is in, in, in whatever way be, is, if, if thinks that he or she is pressured into checking things out, uh, then I think chances are there is going to be resistance. So I think we need to do some groundwork first. Uh, we need to uh, come along with the pastor or deacon or elder and say, we really love the church. We are not here to uh, challenge your authority or your leadership. But we are here uh, because, we, because, because we believe very, very passionately that the church is, 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 belongs to Christ and the church really needs to be healthy. And so then I would uh, spend some time to really earn the trust of the leader or leaders uh, by being obedient and, and by participating in what the church does. And, and I would keep, keep praying about uh, opportune time to arise. And then, since it will be very difficult for us to ask pastor or elder to sit down and listen to what I have to say for the next two hours, that's not going to happen. I would uh, give as a Christmas gift J.D. Greer's Winning by Losing. And I'll say this, I'll say to Pastor, Pastor, um, uh, this is a, a gift from the bottom of my heart. I've read it more than once. I've read it twice. I, in fact, I've read it three times. And each time I read, I, I've been praying that someday that God will give you the time to read this. So, uh, uh, I, I know you're a busy man, but with all due respect, I would really ask you to, to read this book. And uh, because I love the church, I love you, Pastor, and so on. That's how, how, how I might uh, approach. And then, and then I would even actually say, I would love to hear uh, what you have to say about this book. Because uh, the more I read or the more I think about this, what's written in this book, I, I'm, I'm really sensing that the Lord wants to say something about our church. And so if the pastor reads and gives you a time for conversation, praise the Lord. And really then you can enter into a conversation. And really the ideal thing is to have that pastor or elder to lead. The person has to lead, uh, we, you know, because that's what the pastor's job is. Uh, another uh, suggestion I would uh, uh, make is the, uh, asking the, the pastor to take a course at ATS on missional church. I think that would be uh, 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 very important. Or not at, if not at ATS, wherever a similar course is offered or a weekend workshop or something you know, along this line. Be because I believe that it has to start with the leadership. Yeah, very, very important. Now, the second question. What do you do with those people who, who are not responding? Well, I believe that given enough time, they will eventually respond. 
Okay? And that is why having a strict membership class is so important. Just because people are coming, don't just accept them and be happy that now your church is went from 100 to 200. Well, if your church went very quickly from 100 to 200 without really training those additional 100, now your job is that much more difficult. So while you have 100, train them well. And then as, you, as the Lord adds 10, 20, 30, and 40, well, keep training them. In other words, having a large number who do not understand what church is, it may not be the blessing. It may, may be a curse down the road. Anybody else? Yeah. Please use the microphone. Uh, on, on the area of uh, transitioning, uh, transitioning mode, could you elaborate about the thinking behind? Sorry, elaborate on? Uh, on thinking beyond the church towards the kingdom of God. Towards the, sorry? Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. How do we do that? Yes, uh, how do you transition from thinking uh, uh, beyond the church into the kingdom of God? What's the difference between the, the church and the kingdom of God? Okay. So, um, the church is more concrete and localized. So I think of 50 people in my church. I think of 100 people in my church. And uh, as a pastor, I think about what I can do for them and I can, what I can do with them. That's thinking about church. Oh, it'll be nice if our church people went through this Bible study with me together. It'll be nice if our church people did this, learned this uh, praise songs with me together and so on. That's thinking about the church. Thinking about the kingdom is imagining, envisioning, thinking about what God is thinking about these people that are outside the church and how God wants 50 people that are with me, 100 people that are with me, uh, how God wants to use us to reach out to these people that are outside the church. And I think the first step, one of the first steps we can really teach our people to think about people outside is teaching people to be hospitable. Now, when you uh, read about missional church conversation, strangely, and it, it shouldn't be strange, but there are a lot of references to hospitality. One of the signs of a missional church is that its members practice hospitality so naturally. Hospitality as in when a church, when a, a visitor comes to church, they are so hospital, hospitable with this person willing to go extra mile with this person. Uh, when a stranger on the road is asking for help, your church members are so trained that they would like to help this stranger. Now, why is that so crucial to be hospitable to people you have never seen before? I believe that when you meet a stranger, a new world opens up before you. New world opens up new opportunity, new network of people opens up for you. But as long as you're working and, and, and living with people that you have known all your life, your world does not expand. So sometimes strangers are God's way of opening up your world. When strangers come your way, do not shut that opportunity. You see? So sometimes I think it's a great idea to have an extra room in your house and you make it your personal ministry to invite a, someone who needs a lodging for the night to come and stay with you for the night. And that creates a new network, a new possibility, uh, perhaps some area that the Lord wants you or your church to, to get into. You never know, you might entertain angels in the process. So hospitality is one thing that we can teach our people. And so church that is uh, not stingy, but church that is into sharing and caring are the, usually the churches that are missional. But church members who do not know how to share, how to care, well, 
the church will not develop into a missional church. Because it's all about being others-centered rather than self-centered. I hope that gives you some, some ideas, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Good evening, doctor. Thank you so much for the uh, very nice informative presentation. My question is, because you mentioned transitioning into a missional church involving, involves doing things that you may not like doing. And it involves doing? Doing things that you may, not, you may not like doing. Yes. And I suppose that involves making tough decisions. Mm. And uh, I, I'm just interested, what were the uh, tough decisions that you made or the hindrances that you somehow uh, met along the way? And uh, how did you resolve on that? Thank you. Well, for example, every church operates on a limited budget. We don't have all the money we, you know, we want to spend for missions. So for a mission to, to happen, something has to go. So that means maybe instead of um, uh, more support for church members, we are willing to take a cut. Uh, maybe, okay, so the size of Marianda it shrinks so that with that money, we can help people outside. So, so, so that would be something uncomfortable. Nobody wants that, you know. People want to... Uh, uh, so in our church, for example, uh, when we want to do something overseas, it's not because the church has so much money that we can build orphanage here and community center there. No, it's usually at the expense of something else. Yeah. For example, our pastors have not given raise in many years. <laughs> um, we are because we're men of God, we don't talk about our salary too much. If they want to give raise, let it be so. But we don't go out and complain, you know. But things like that, for example. You don't seem all that happy about this particular <laughs> example, but, uh, you know. Is that a... Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else? Would like first timers, yeah. Yeah, the first timers first. Good evening, doctor. So as I freshly graduate in seminary, as a young minister of God, how can I start this ministry if the church where I'm serving is not doing mission? Is it okay to go out and do this kind of ministry with other church who has who has the missional mindset? Are you saying, are you in a position to start a church or? No, no. No. Is it okay to join? Oh, but you, you mean you are part of a church, but is it okay for me to leave the church? Yes, that's why I'm asking. Uh, but not knowing your situation, it's very difficult for me to advise. He's saying that his church right now is some kind of very traditional, not, uh, not missional. Okay, okay. Yeah, so sometimes uh, it is more difficult to transition a traditional church into a missional church than to start from scratch a missional church. So, I mean, you need to pray to the Lord. And, and, uh, but I would, I would say this. Do not attempt this lightly. You need to be well convinced from the scripture. Um, how, how do I know I'm convinced? If you can give two, three, four, five, six hours, on and on continuously from the scripture that this is what missional church is, then maybe you're ready. If you run out of material after 10 minutes, okay? But if you're able to talk about missional church for two hours, for three hours, going through all these different chapters of the Bible, then maybe you are ready, okay? So don't start in a hasty manner. You need to be convinced from the scripture first. That's what I would say. Okay. I just want to uh, know about the process of from vision to training to the praxis. Uh, how long, how would you know that they are, uh, they are sufficiently uh, trained mm. so that they can go 
storage practices. Right. So, um, I obviously I presented it in a chronological way, uh, as though you need vision followed by training, and then now finally expressed in praxis. Uh, yes, it is, it is certainly a, that direction, but sometimes you need to do all three things at the same time because they will feed one another. So when you have vision, you also get trained a little bit, and then you put into practice and see what happens. And then sometimes you need to go back and rework the vision, rework the training, and then again into pra practice. There's no point in waiting five years, ten years, and not practicing anything. Uh, that, would, uh, that would not be right. So I would say, yes, it's going in that direction, but you need to put all three things and, and get it going. Yeah. That's what I would do. <laughs> I have a question. If I am dreaming to become a missionary pastor, do I have a work hard and have a big savings to, to let my dream come true? I don't think so. Because, um, you know, uh, of course we have uh, such a thing as tent maker missionary who does not rely on the support of other people. Uh, but in general, as a missionary, we need the support of God's people. So I don't think it is scriptural that I need to become rich uh, in order, or to have a very good job in order to become a missionary. I mean, there, there are cases for tent making, but I think the, by and large what God wants is that you are recognized, you are approved by your community to go out and the, your community will support you. One last question, yes. Please come forward. Can I ask two questions again? Okay, so um, one is um, among Chinese, ch Filipino Chinese churches, it's, I think, I, I'm not very sure, but I think it's more difficult to encourage Filipino Chinese Christians to go into pastoral or missionary work. Mm. We are quicker in giving offerings but like to, you know, to, to dedicate your life, uh, it's more difficult. So can you give us tips? Like how can we encourage young people or even other, like adults to, to go into full-time ministry? That's the first question. Uh, the second question is I noticed that you also have Kairos course as part of your training. So can you give us tips also on what post-Kairos follow-up do you do? Like after these people, uh, finish Kairos, how do you help them? So okay. those two questions. Thank you so much. Okay. And you also had two questions before, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and they're both excellent questions. Uh, so she obviously comes from Chinese Filipino community where, um, and I've heard this before as well, that, uh, you know, when your children are very bright, you, you pick them to be your successor of your business or your company. And if your child is not so bright, then you send them to ministry. <laughs> yeah. um, in some ways, uh, uh, it speaks about the value, that value. It speaks about uh, the value, the Chinese Filipino community's value in that we need to protect our wealth, we need to protect our establishment, make sure that it continues to grow. Well, at the same time, we need church, but uh, the brilliant ones need to be in the business world to continue this. And not so brilliant ones can still go to ATS to get their MDiv and be our pastor. It's okay, because the brilliant ones will continue to feed the church with finance and so on. Well, that's very myo myopic in my opinion because uh, we need the very best in the church. You know why young people are leaving the church today? Because the preaching is, is subpar, that's why. Yeah, if you preach really well, people are gonna come. Now, I'm just giving you one example, okay? If 
if Christian leaders are exemplary in their way of living, young people will be attracted to that lifestyle. See, young people are, are staying away from the church not because they're secularized, but because they're bored. If you will challenge them with something so that they, they, they believe it's worthwhile even to exchange with their lives, they will do it. That's what youth is all about. See, so far in our churches, we've, uh, we've played too safe, too safe. Yeah, we want you to go to ATS, but uh, come back and don't preach such a great sermon because then you cannot get everybody into mission field. You will the good ones in the business world. Yeah, um, I think God is able to handle both. We can, God can produce brilliant ones in the business world, and God can also have brilliant ones in ministry so that the church is strong and the business is strong, right? I think we can have both. So how do we, how do we, um, how do we change that? Well, number one, you need to become the senior pastor of a Chinese Filipino church, <laughs> and you need to preach like that, as you really mean it, you know? Yeah. Now, what do you do after Kairos course? I would say, then next step is now take the people to urban missions, short-term mission. Take the people to Cambodia. Take people to Indonesia. One month, two months, three months. Take them. Why not? That's, that's what I would do. And that's what I do in our church too. Okay, so thank you very much for your patience and for your participation tonight. We would like to appreciate Dr. Min Ho. We we'll just have a time to thank Dr. Thank Min Ho. Just a small token. Thank you very much. For tonight. God bless you. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's been a great honor and privilege to share uh, this uh, topic with you. And God bless you, and uh, may God give you uh, passion for his name and for the gospel. Let's all stand as we join together in prayer. Let's pray. A loving God, we are so grateful for tonight, how you have opened our hearts and our minds to new things, great things, for the church and for your kingdom. I pray that each one of us would gain not only the perspective of what it means to be a missional church, but the passion to start becoming a missional person, influencing our churches so that we will become missional churches, oh God. All for your glory and for your honor. Nothing is impossible with you. So Lord, As we meditate on these truths we have heard, I pray that it will bear fruit, fruit that will remain, fruit that will continue to multiply. So empower us, each one of us, through your Holy Spirit. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, God's people, now and forevermore. Amen, amen. Good evening to everyone. God bless.